a warm welcome to tonight's annual lecture. Events like tonight's never cease to amaze me at the labor they generate. They also remind me of what a fantastic place SOAS is. We are effortly synchronized tonight through the Centers and Programs Office and the alumni team. Nena Chuku Ziba Salman, without you, tonight and tomorrow would not be possible. And ladies and gentlemen, I would really like you to put your hands together for two fabulous women and their teams and um, join me in thanking them for tonight's event. I would um, <clears throat> also like to thank the SOAS Alumni and SOAS South Asia Institute for sponsoring tonight's annual lecture. And a special thanks to our musician, Morgan Davies for his beautiful piece that was available to all of us to listen at the start, and to our colleagues in the AV and comms for their continued support. <clears throat> With the thank yous over, as Deborah has mentioned, CSP is at the heart of cutting edge research on Pakistan. We are always aware that Pakistan as a nation is a relatively recent creation, so our understanding extends back prior to partition to think about the various legacies and traditions which inform contemporary Pakistan and its diaspora in ways which sometimes get overlooked. One of our aims is to look beyond the stereotyping frames of a good and bad place as reported in the media and delve deeper into the complexity and diversity of cultural and political elements that make up Pakistan. The rich heritage of the Pakistani diaspora draws in elements, ancient and modern, Islamic, and hailing from the pre- and non-Islamic traditions of South Asia. This is often forgotten in the rush to stereotype. In the center, we are keen to explore all areas of cultural activity because it seems to me that any attempt to understand this or any other minority community has first to understand the way it imagines itself. And that comes through the art, culture, and literature of the people as much as, if not more than, from political theorists, nationalist politicians, and many others. I have had the opportunity to bring to the center's research activities my collaboration with the UEL SOAS Research Project, Muslims Trust and Cultural Dialogue, funded by the Research Councils UK, Looking back to the early days, the project director, Professor Peter Mori, asked me how I saw issues of trust affecting Pakistani communities in Britain. I started by thinking that it's often suggested that Pakistani communities are insular and don't engage with other communities around them. In fact, Pakistani communities have a vibrant culture and interact daily with others. Those instances where there is a ghettoization are really to do with patterns of poverty and comparative deprivation, rather than any instinct to seal themselves off. These musings then sparked off deeper conversations about the nature of trust itself and how it is established in society. The MTCD project, in collaboration with the center, sponsored two major international conferences on Muslims, trust, and multiculturalism, and beyond Islamophobia in 2013 and 2014, here at SOAS. In February 2015, we held a literature festival on cultural confluences, supported by our in-house professorial research associate, the novelist and short story writer Amir Hussain, and endorsed by the award-winning British playwright Howard Brenton, for being at the cutting edge of contemporary literature festivals. This was followed by a major photography exhibition held at the Brunei Gallery on the Art of Integration, Islam in England's Green and Pleasant Land by the internationally acclaimed photographer Peter Sanders. For the first time, we also offered school visits to the exhibition. However, the highlight of the UEL, so as Muslims Trust and Cultural Dialogue project, has of course been our collaboration with Professor Akbar S. Ahmed. The idea to work together emerged from a conversation after an event at SOAS celebrating his successful Journey into America project. We invited Professor Ahmed and his team to conduct field research on Muslims in Britain, and that then snowballed into the Journey into Europe 
Professor Ahmed, who never sleeps at night, was unstoppable in his quest for peace, building narratives in Europe. He attracted further funding and made it into a much bigger project. To have been part of the journey into Europe, Islam, immigration, and empire experience has been simply phenomenal. I have learned so much. The findings from the project also form the basis of a monograph with Brookings that Professor Ahmed is working on and have led to his new documentary film, Journey into Europe, that Deborah spoke about, which is being screened tomorrow and to which I hope you will return. So I am so grateful to both Professor Ahmed and to Professor Bhikkhu Parikh for traveling long distances to be with us today and for their generous support of our research. And for tonight's annual lecture to begin, I would like first to invite Professor Ahmed to come and sit, kick off the conversation on ISIS, Paris, and Pakistan, the search for peace. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much, Dr. Amina Yakin. You are such a star on campus and I congratulate you for the center and the work you're doing uh, with the other star, Zeba Salman, and my friend, Peter More. You really are at the cutting edge of knowledge as far as our subject and discipline, uh, these are concerned. Uh, it's really an honor and I'm thrilled to be back to this campus. I've spent some very, very happy times here many, many years ago. And I am conscious that my wife, Zenith, and my colleague, Frankie Martin, who's come with me from Washington, D.C., they are equally grateful. Thank you so much. Now, I see so many friends and colleagues here. I don't dare name them because I cannot name all of you. There's so many of you. But I will single out two individuals, two br brilliant individuals connected to the University of London. So there's a logic. Uh, young Mina, who's at the LSE, and young Dr. Moin Bose. Uh, he teaches at SOAS, uh, Mina's at the LSE. Mina's my granddaughter, Moin is my nephew, so a bit of nepotism. <laughs> You'll forgive me, remember these are Asian habits, we can't get out of them. <laughs> now, <clears throat> my friend from the Pakistan High Commission asked me about the title. He was concerned that I had placed Pakistan alongside ISIS. And this was an interesting, uh, Jatoi Sahib, where are you? Where are you? There, there we are. Now, this was an interesting comment because he's a young diplomat. I was an older diplomat. To me, Pakistan means something entirely different, perhaps, to what it means for my young colleague. To me, Pakistan means Jinnah, Jinnah's Pakistan. And I'm going to talk about that, and that is what the message I want you to carry back to the High Commission and to the Foreign Office. Do not forget Jinnah, because you forget Jinnah, and there's nothing left in Pakistan. Then you have ISIS left. That is your battle, and I'll build that uh, in my talk. Uh, I do want to thank <coughs> my friend, Lord Bhikkhu Parikh. Uh, you perhaps don't know this, but he is not only one of the leading social scientists, we go back many, many decades, but he's had a family tragedy. He came all the way from Hull. He was due to fly back to India to attend to a family tragedy. And he postponed the visit back to India simply to be with us this evening. So, Bhikkhu, double gratitude. Thank you so much for that. Thank you for coming. So with that, let's plunge into the, my few remarks. So when we are preparing for this talk, Zeba, Amina, and myself, we were talking about the title, what could convey the vastness in the Muslim world, the chaos, the violence, the different points, Paris at one end, ISIS at the other end, Pakistan, <clears throat> which for me represents something in the Muslim world. What relates these to each other, these points on the compass? How do we explain the connections? Is there a grand theory? How do we promote peace in these societies that these different points represent? Now, these are the kinds of questions that I have been asking over the last few decades. Those of you who are familiar with my work may know that in the last decade or so, I've been involved in four major projects, four major field projects. And Frankie Martin is very in intrinsic to that, uh, those projects. So is Zenith, my wife. We've traveled for years in the field. We've written, we've interviewed thousands of people and then come to conclusions. So it's not just me giving opinions. 
these are opinions based on investigation. And over the four projects, we came to realize that the clearest way of understanding Islam, which is such a complicated subject, paradoxical, ironic, changing, uh, baffling, controversial, is not to fall into the trap of using all these neologisms, new phrases that are constantly coming out of the experts, Islamicists and jihadists and radicalists. I'm not even sure what the latest ist is. But these terms which add to the confusion, they do not really clarify anything. But to simply try to categorize the categories of Muslim social and political action, the three broad categories. Understanding Max Weber's caveat that these are ideal types. Ideal types are not a substitute for reality. They're simply something to allow us to grasp and try to, uh, try, allow us to try to understand. So ideal types allow us to construct something in our minds in order to understand the complexity of societies. They are not societies. Understanding that, these are the three different categories. And remarkably, we saw these face to face confronting us in India. And where in India? Ajmer. Who is an Ajmer? One of the greatest saints in South Asian history, Khwaja Gharib al Nawaz, Moinuddin Chishti. Aligarh. Who is an Aligarh? Who started Aligarh? Sir Sayyid Ahmad Khan. So Sayyid Ahmad Khan creates Aligarh in the middle of the 19th century. The third great category, Deoband, also in India. And I was astounded, neatly we have these three, contrasting three distinct categories. Again, my warning, there's overlap, there's borrowing, there's changing. You may be part of one category when you're a young man, later in life you may belong to a different kind of category. But these broadly define Muslim political activity. And invariably the clash is taking place between the mystics and the literalists, which is Deoband. So you have mystic Islam, Ajmer, modernist Islam, Aligarh, and literalist Islam in Deoband. Again, overlap, changing, not ironclad, but allowing us to think of these three broad categories. <coughs> Why India? Because India for a thousand years was a land where Hindus, Muslims, Sikhs were able to interact and nourish each other, challenge each other, and really create a society, which in some ways was quite unique even in the Muslim world. And you will see that South Asian Islam begins to take shape primarily because it is constantly interacting with Hindu civilization. So it must compete. If there's a Congress there, there must be a Muslim League here. If there's a Gandhi there, there must be a Jinnah here. So you are constantly in South Asia faced with a very advanced, sophisticated civilization, which at times is friendly, at times is uh, tension, at times there's overlap, there's alliances, there are conflicts, but it is there. No other Muslim society in the world has this I would say privilege. The result is that what came out of India was really cutting edge in terms of Muslim thought. So it's no surprise that Aligarh happens to be in India in the 19th century. Alama Iqbal is produced in India, not in Pakistan. He dreams of Pakistan, but he is born and uh, lives in India. Qaid e Azam Muhammad Ali Jinnah is born there. So Amir Ali, you've got a whole series of people coming out of that, uh, that environment. What that environment also does is creates a further synthesis between British culture, British civilization, and South Asian civilization. That in turn gives another dynamic to the Muslim identities coming out of South Asia, which again is missing in the Middle East or North Africa. And that goes back to Lord Macaulay himself in 1835. Now, I don't think Lord Macaulay had in mind that one day the mayor of London is going to be Muslim and there'll be lords and members of parliament who will be Muslim. I don't think that's what he was aiming for. But that became the unintended consequence of his promoting an idea of Indians who would be Indian in blood and color, but English in taste, morality, and intellect. 
So here's another way emerging in the 19th century in terms of responses to modernity. If you take a look at the rest of the Muslim world, at the same time, you'll see the Sanusi in North Africa, a great Sufi saint, mystic figure in North Africa. And the Sanusi fight. They fight the colonial Italians. They'll fight the colonial French. They'll have bitter battles. And the French will not be as reasonable or as kind as the British colonialists. And I'm, by the way, not advocating, uh, Nicholas, with all due apologies, I'm not advocating imperialism or colonialism. I'm just pointing this out. <laughs> so Nicholas Barrington says, why not? <laughs> so compared to what was happening in North Africa, where the French literally believed that Algeria was an extension of France, any opposition, any distinction was to be completely exterminated. I'm not using the word loosely. Out of three million people, two million were killed by the French. Two out of three million. The mind boggles. Here we had, on the other hand, colleges like Aligarh. You had Deoband. Deoband is a creation of the time of the British. You had Ajmer flourishing at the time of the British. So there was, a, there was an opportunity to maneuver and to grow. And I want to be very careful here. When I say Deoband, I'm not talking in terms of Deoband equals violence. We have to be very careful about this. This is a slippery slope. They believe that Islam is under attack. The boundaries must be created around Islam. They must be defended. They're not advocating violence. But there are people who can then take from them a line and begin to say, well, we have to fight back, and that can then turn into a, a, a form of confrontation, it can lead to violence. So you're seeing how those lines then get caught up with what is happening in today's world. So the Sanusi in North Africa, you have Wahhab, uh, Muhammad Wahhab in uh, Saudi Arabia, the previous century. You have the Wahhabis, or called the Wahhabis, they don't like to be called Wahhabis, but Wahhab's descendants then teaming up with the Sauds, the creation of Saudi Arabia in the early part of the 20th century, the oil, the world coming to Saudi Arabia to trade, the power of oil, and very soon you have Saudi influence uh, in the Muslim world and the impact. Now in the meantime, this is the Arab world, North Africa. In the meantime, what's happening in South Asia? In the meantime, you have the modernist version of Islam in Aligarh, producing generation after generation of scientists, statesmen, politicians, prime ministers, presidents, and an idea of a modern Islam. This is vital to understand. And Jatoh Sahib, this is the biggest lesson that Pakistan has to give. Because Pakistan's vision, not what we've done to Pakistan, but Pakistan's vision of Pakistan, as depicted by Mr. Jinnah, the founding father, was of a modern Muslim nation, a nation which gives rights to women, to minorities, respect for the rule of law, complete condemnation of nepotism, of corruption, of any kind of neglect, of poverty, of the poor. His whole focus was on the poor, social justice, these are almost a passion with Jinnah. If you read his speeches, which I did for the film I made on him and the books I wrote on him, they're almost a passion with him. He's ill, he's dying, but this is a passion with him. And that culture allows a, an easy interaction with the larger Hindu culture. So that when he and Gandhi trade political barbs at each other, there's a, a good humor about it. There's almost a schoolboy humor about it. The famous exchange when Gandhi and Jinnah meet and the Mahatma says, Mr. Jinnah, you have mesmerized the Muslims. And Jinnah looks back at him and says, Mr. Gandhi, you have hypnotized the Hindus. <laughs> now this is schoolboy alliteration, I admit that. But I can't quite imagine Mr. Modi and Mr. Nawashri pulling this off. <laughs> so I'm not sure how they would use this alliteration. So there was this sense of confidence, and this came from the South Asian milieu. And we need to understand this. This also created an idea of a modern Muslim in terms of modernist Islam, an idea of balancing faith and modernity. Something that goes back a thousand years to the time of Andalusia, the time of Bayt al-Hikmah in Baghdad, when Muslims could balance living in the world with confidence, with their respect for ilm and knowledge, their respect for compassion, God's names are Rahim and Rahman, 
be Muslims and be part of the world, something that they lost over the centuries. This modernist Islam was what people imagined the Muslim world would be heading towards when the independence movements began. So if you look at the 1950s and 60s, you will see Jinnah in Pakistan, Tenku in Malaysia, you will see the, even the kings in the Middle East, King Farouk or the king of Morocco or the king of Jordan, all of them are depicting a modernist Islam. And you get a sense that there's a struggle between the three categories, but modernist Islam will prevail. It is into the 70s and 80s when the Muslim world begins to fall apart. You have revolutions, you have chaos, you have foreign powers involved in playing games, and you have a sense of turmoil out of control, not being able to control this, this turmoil. And modernist Islam begins to take a hit because in the meantime, the modernist structures of these states begin to show signs of decay, of corruption, of nepotism, of dynasties, more interested in making money than in serving people. So the result is that the promise of modernity begins to fall apart. And in that vacuum, in that vacuum, nature abhors a vacuum, in that vacuum you begin to see the emergence of marginal groups. So whether it's the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or the Boko Haram or Al-Shabaab, they begin to emerge. And they emerge literally from tribal societies who are not part of modernist Islam and they are not prepared to accept modernist Islam. And you can see immediately you have a, a contradiction in society because they're not prepared to accept parliament, bureaucracy, the structure school. Their targets are the symbols of modern Islam. So the Taliban will attack the army, public school in Peshawar and kill 150 people on campus, including about 140 children, kids. Why? Because that is the symbol of the state. They're rejecting it. And ultimately, to me, that is the battle in the Muslim world. So, trying to wind this up and just present some ideas because Dr. Amina is giving me some very dirty looks. <laughs> Peter, you can interpret those looks, but I suspect they are dirty. <laughs> He's agreeing. If that is the case, then we have to ask ourselves, how do we help the Muslim world help itself? By making the Muslim world understand the tensions, the structures that exist within it, and helping it move in a certain direction. Now, if we in the Muslim world are not even aware of our own features and our own strengths and our own characteristics, how are we going to move towards resolving the tensions that exist? That is the challenge. In this project, uh, Journey into Europe, and I hope you'll come and see the film tomorrow, you'll be astounded at the contribution that Islam has made to Europe. You'll be absolutely astounded. Science, architecture, literature, everything. I mean, I'm constantly, my mind is blown. And I talk to Muslims and they have no idea. I talk to Europeans, they have no idea. Dante, the Inferno, Robinson Crusoe, Cervantes, Don Quixote, all this is coming from most directly Muslim literature. How many people know this? The first person to fly, to take flight, Ibn Firnas in Cordoba, a thousand years ago. How many Muslims know this? The saying of the Prophet, the ink of the scholar is more sacred than the blood of the martyr. How many Muslims know this? How many Muslims know that the second most used word in the Quran after God is ilm, knowledge? So God is telling Muslims, God is not saying go and blow yourself up. God is saying seek knowledge, seek knowledge, seek knowledge, seek knowledge. Second most used word. And now take a look at the Muslim world and I mean, I'll finish with this. Cordoba. A thousand years ago, the main library, please remember this statistic, especially for Muslims, especially for scholars, and Jatui Saab for the High Commissioner. Cordoba, a thousand years ago, 600,000 manuscripts in the main library. 600,000 manuscripts, a thousand years ago. The largest library in, in Europe, 600, 600 manuscripts. 600,000? 600. That is the Muslim world. There's no Oxford then, there's no Cambridge then. The Bishop of Oxford sends scholars to Spain and says, what do we need to do? They come back with these blueprints for these things called colleges and quads and dormitories and tutorials 
And that is set up first at Oxford, then at Cambridge, and that is how Oxford and Cambridge start. So the Muslim world is implementing its vision of a society. And then recently, the contrast for you, Harvard University produces more scientific publications, Harvard University, one university, than the entire Arab world put together. Now just think of what I'm telling you. Nobel Prizes, the Muslim world is about 25% of the world population. How many Nobel Prizes do Muslims win? 0.3% or 2%. The Jewish world population is 0.0% or 2% or 3%. And they, the Jewish population, has earned 25% of the prizes. Something is going wrong in the Muslim world. And I, as a Muslim, as a very proud Muslim, as a Muslim father, as a Muslim grandfather, I'm not satisfied. I would hope that young Mina in the third generation, Moin in the second generation, will accept this challenge and revive the notion of ilm within Islam, of Rahim and Rahman within Islam, that is compassion and beneficence, and reach out to others in the way that God has wanted in the Quran genuine plural acceptance of others. Reach out to them. The famous Judaic saying is tikkun olam, which means heal a fractured world. And to me, a good Muslim must heal a fractured world. And that should be our challenge. Thank you. May I invite now Professor Lord Piku Parekh, who needs no introduction. He is the author of several widely acclaimed books, including Rethinking Multiculturalism, and recently, Debating India, Essays on Indian Political Discourse. He is also the recipient of the Sir Isaiah Berlin Prize for Lifetime Contribution to Political Philosophy, the BBC's Special Lifetime Achievement Award, and Padma Bhushan from the President of India. Welcome, Professor Parekh. Well, where do we start? Uh, well, that was a fascinating talk. Uh, I mean, I think th there can't be a dialogue unless I can provoke some kind of disagreement with you. <laughs> <laughs> and I should certainly try to do that. But before that, I want to make uh, one general point. You talked about South Asia and South Asia's distinctive contribution to Islam. And I remember saying this, I think about 25 or 30 years ago, when your book, Anthropology and Justice, had come out, and there was a panel discussion involving myself, Christina Lamb, and somebody else. And I asked you at the time, and I'm going to ask again, when one talks about Islam, I think one is making a category mistake, because there are Islams. There is no single Islam. I mean, Islam has already become part of a particular society, a particular tradition, and therefore you can't simply equate one Islam with another. Islam of Indonesia has absorbed so much of Hinduism, is quite different from Islam in Malaysia, which is different from South Asia and all that. And the question I had then asked you was, uh, is South Asia, Middle East is making all the noises, which it was in the 80s, as you say. Is South Asia capable of making a distinct contribution uh, to Islam? South Asian scholarship. And I think you said at the time, if I remember correctly, that perhaps one day it would, but wasn't doing so yet. And I would want, in the light of what you said, since those memories came back, I thought I would tempt you to, or draw you out on saying something more. Because you were saying, here was India, in response to Hinduism, Although there is no reason why you can't have some other interlocutor in response to which you are constantly asked to identify yourself. But Islam in South Asia responding to Hinduism, which was itself eclectic and all that, feeling much more relaxed, not a kind of uh, another monolithic religion forcing it to change. And therefore, uh, Islam much more relaxed, giving rise to Sufism, giving rise to all kinds of blurred boundaries, and from that, you had Said Bam Khan and lots of other people. I wonder if th 
those regenerative sources are still there in South Asian Islam, in India in particular. I mean, that will be one question I would like to raise with you. The other point I want to raise with you was about uh, uh, Jinnah, very briefly, because I think it will come up in questions later. But Jinnah, I think, is a very complex man. At one level, he is somebody who is thoroughly secular. When Pakistan becomes independent, he says, we are all Pakistanis, not Hindus or Muslims. But then on the way to, that leads up to it, he talks about Hindus and Muslims as totally separate, nothing in common, they can't live together, they, therefore they can't form a single nation. Now with that kind of thinking, you begin to see that there are two jinnas. There is jinnah that leads up to the secular jinnah, but there is also the jinnah which on the way has picked up a lot of ideological baggage. And the question is, in Pakistan's anatomy today, there are these two jinnas gesturing to each other without being able to come to terms. One is the jinnah, the secularist. The other is jinnah, which had said that the Hindus and Muslims can never be together. Muslims are always going to be under threat and therefore should deserve a separate Pakistan. So maybe that uh, it wasn't a question of lovely time when Qaeda Azam was absolutely wonderful and then things began to go downhill. Maybe the seeds of ambiguity were there from the beginning. I think at that point I should stop. You talked about figures about Nobel Prize and all that, but I would take that a little easy. <laughs> I wouldn't worry too much about Muslims not getting Nobel Prize. I mean, I, in India we have the same kind of talk. Here is a country of 1.2.5 billion people. Why can't we have more Nobel Prize in us? Well, I mean, you know, the, 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 it has a history, it is a backdrop. I mean, once a community begins to acquire a certain momentum, it throws the people of its own accord. Uh, but nevertheless, I think you are absolutely right that in the Islamic world, you give the example of Harvard. The example I saw was the Spanish university, that Spain, single country Spain, produces far more books than all the Arab countries put together. Shame. Why does this happen? We need to be thinking about it. And I think you are absolutely right to raise your agonized voice against that trend. But on that point, I better stop and allow you to respond and then maybe we can carry it a little further. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Biko. Now, that, Biko, you do know I write poetry, so a poet must have anguish and anguish is what I think a Muslim poet uh, feels when he looks at the plight of his community. Uh, in terms of your questions about Islam in South Asia, India especially, and uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, I really see again the three categories. Uh, when you look at you, we talked about Ajmer, uh, we talked about the Sufis, the mystics. It is amazing, Bhikkhu, that even today the strength of Islam, particularly in the rural areas, in terms of mysticism, is very, very strong. If you go to Sindh, rural Sindh, uh, the great Sufi saints there who are like great scholars of Islam, go to Punjab, again similar, again in the frontier you have the same, I've lived there, I've worked there. You're also seeing a clash directly between the militants, the militant groups, whatever term you want to use for them, attacking these centers. So they become also targets. Traditionally in South Asia, I have seen that it is these mystics who have played a critical role in preserving Islam and preserving a very compassionate, inclusivist <coughs> Islam, which is very significant. Uh, you know that Mia Mir, the great Sufi saint of Lahore, actually placed the foundational stone of the great golden temple of the Sikhs in Amritsar. See, this is a fact. And if you talk to the Sikhs, they have very high regard for Mia Mir, the Sufi saint. Again, a lot of people don't know this, but that allows you to cross these boundaries and cross them through love, through compassion. Now, in terms of uh, Jinnah, uh, Qaeda Azam for Pakistan. He is a fascinating character because, as you are right, he was he is coming from a very different perspective. He starts life uh, very much as an ambassador of Hindu-Muslim unity. He's very conscious of that. And paradoxically, when you talk of Jinnah, you must talk of Gandhi because he is criticizing Gandhi for using religion, as you know. 
He's saying you mustn't bring religion in because once that happens, it's difficult to control. And that is what begins to happen as Gandhi becomes more popular, religion begins to spread in uh, his followers, and very soon you have the tension between the communities. Into the 1920s, you're seeing Jinnah still resisting that. To the point that Alama Iqbal, the voice of the Muslim community in his poetry, he criticizes Jinnah. And he says, you're not really connecting with the, the common Muslim. And at a point, Mr. Jinnah is disgusted, he's fed up with local politics, and he packs up and comes to London. And he has to be persuaded to come back in the 1930s. And that, to me, is a very dramatic conversion in his life. You know, we're talking about the ironies and paradoxes of individuals, men and women, and why people do what they do. But I find that those last years of Jinnah, and I've studied this in great detail, uh, and you could say, well, he's being cynical, you could say that he's a politician and so on, but he is undergoing a transformation because he is wanting to give voice to his people. He's becoming the symbol, the living symbol of his people. And he's connecting with them in a way, Biko, and I studied this through pictures. You know, as a scholar, I said, he's getting a reception the Beatles would envy. He's an old man, he's almost 70 years old, he's not very outgoing. He's not very um, gregarious, not very social, he's a bit reserved, he's very anglicized, and yet the reception he's getting is of mob hysteria. And I ask myself, what is going on? What are these ordinary Muslims seeing in this man? And they're seeing in him a counterweight to the great stars that are rising in the Congress. Nehru is a great star, Gandhi is a great star, and the Muslims have no one except for Jinnah. So Jinnah is now being elevated to the level where Muslims can say, we have a heavyweight too and we are proud of this heavyweight. And I've got quotations from people who were alive at that time, who heard his speeches, and Jinnah couldn't even speak Urdu. He spoke in English. And they'd listen to his speeches and they'd say, we don't understand what he's saying. But whatever he says, we agree with, because we trust him. So here's Jinnah being converted from a politician into some sort of a, almost a mystical leader of people who have faith in him because they have faith in him. This, as you know, is Max Weber's classic uh, definition of charisma. Now, what happens when Pakistan is made? You're absolutely right. He's giving his legal, his logical reasons for a Pakistan, for the preservation of Pakistan and so on, and the preservation of the Muslim minority. But what Pakistan does he want to be good? This is the question I want to um, bring to your notice. Read his speeches very carefully, especially the speech he gives in August 1947 to the Constituent Assembly, when he says that in this Pakistan, Hindus will go to their temples, Muslims will go to their mosques, Christians go to their churches. You're free to worship as you want to. That has nothing to do with the state of Pakistan. So he's giving an idea of Pakistan, a modern Pakistan, where everyone must feel part of the state and have their rights protected. Of a cabinet of seven, one of, one of them is a Hindu. Uh, his first Christmas, his only Christmas, December 1947, is spent in a church with the Christian community. Not many people in Pakistan knew that, but he actually spends the whole day with the Christian community. So he's constantly reaching out uh, to the minorities. There's a famous scene in which uh, he's proceeding, I think it's a state bank opening or something, and along the way he sees a riot. He stops, the entourage stops, and he gets out of the car and his ADCs, his uh, military escort, and they become very nervous. They say, sir, there's a riot. These Muslims have just come from India. They've lost everything. They're very emotional. And they've surrounded some Hindus and they're beating them up. And he's furious. And he just jumps into the crowd. And of course, that's a nightmare for his uh, staff. They, they follow him. They're panicking. And they try to get him out. But he's right in the midst of it. And he declares, he says, I will declare myself the protector general of the Hindu minority of Pakistan. This is on record. So Jinnah, to my mind, never loses this cosmopolitan idea of society. Now that he's head of state as governor general, he's going to try to express that vision. He doesn't, doesn't live long enough to translate that into society, but he expresses it for us to understand the kind of Pakistan he had in his mind. It doesn't quite work out. Why doesn't it work out? Because of society. Society is at a very different level. He's at a different level. He dies very early. Very quickly you have a series of political crises followed by martial law, followed by the breakup of Pakistan in 71, back to martial law, and you're seeing where we've got to. 
But Pakistan has a vision, and this is what I maintain, that of all the Muslim countries, Pakistan has the great advantage, and that's why we get Pakistan in the title, that it has the great advantage of having an idea of a modern state, an idea of a modern society. Not quite developed, but it is there. There's something to start with. No other society has that. If you take a look at the Muslim world, they're starting, the Arabs are starting with 400 years of the Ottomans, Ottoman colonization, followed by European colonization. So you see, we have that, and that is the significance of the Muslim presence in South Asia. Why do the idea not take roots? Who? The idea that Jinnah was proposing of a modern state, modern secular state. Why does it disappear with him? I don't think enti entirely disappears Apart because… Apart from occasional appearances. Nay, no, because this is also something interesting. I've thought a lot about this. You see, when given a choice, and again, we are talking as scholars, we must base everything in facts. When there are elections, it's very interesting. When there are elections, you would assume Commentators would say, well, all right, Pakistanis are known to be uh, very religious and of course they're going to vote for uh, religious parties. But every time there's an election in Pakistan, they'll vote for either the Muslim League or the PPP. They will not vote for the jamaat e islami J. You can check up the figures. Yeah. And the uh, religious parties will maybe get 5%, 6%, 7%. When Benazir Bhutto comes back to Pakistan in the 80s and elections are held, she sweeps the elections. What is she standing for? She's standing for an idea of Jinnah's Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And I found this very moving when you say, why is it? It's not completely disappeared. It's a struggle. But Pakistanis are very conscious of this. And that allows them to stay on the path of democracy. When Benazir Bhutto, again, I'm not making a political statement. I'm not making a statement for or against her politically. But when she arrives in Karachi, I was in uh, uh, Washington. And I was asking myself, now this is the test for this young lady. She's arriving in Karachi. She's got two fathers. She's got her own father who was killed, martyred, and she has Mr. Jinnah. Whose mausoleum will she go to first? You know, to pay respect as a daughter of South Asia. And the instinct in South Asia very much is to go to your own father and pay homage, place flowers at the grave and so on. And she arrives at the airport, Biko, and she heads straight for Mr. Jinnah's tomb, where she's attacked and almost blown up. Then she goes to Pindi and she's, of course, killed there. So the instinct in her is to come back for democracy, even at the cost of her life. And I think that instinct is the instinct for democracy planted by the modernist vision of Islam. Jinnah is one of the figures, but there were many, many figures fighting for that idea of modern Islam. So again, go back to the categories. That is the modernist Islam. And if that succeeds, then automatically your extremism, militants, etc., will, if not disappear, will certainly be checked. If modernist Islam continues to falter, the extremists will continue to dominate and play havoc. Okay. Well, uh, let me come back to the next question that you had raised on your talk. When you talk about the modernist Islam, Islam ready to respond to modernity positively and all that, and things begin to go wrong in the 70s and 80s, why do they begin to go wrong in the 70s and 80s? Not before. And by 70s and 80s, what are the major events? I mean, after all, many people would say that Iranian revolution played the same role in the imagination of the Muslims the world over as the Russian revolution did for the left or the French revolution might have done earlier. That here was an, an event where the Muslims were taking control of their own destiny and standing up to the West. How would you locate uh, this shift in Muslim thinking? Again, exactly the three categories. The 70s and 80s are seeing the world changing. You've identified the Iranian revolution. You have the Soviet invasion into Afghanistan in the 80s. You have the emergence of the Taliban in the 1990s. The world is shifting. Pakistan's neighborhood is shifting. And we're not only talking Pakistan, we're talking of the larger Muslim world. Now, in those shifts, the shifts are not towards modernity in terms of our three categories. They are towards literalist Islam. So Khomeini's revolution is actually saying we are going to implement Islam. Islam demands this. And it is literalist Islam. So the compass is now veering away from modernist Islam. And suddenly it's not very fashionable to be like Jinnah. In fact, for the Taliban, Jinnah is the symbol of 
the single symbol of absolute anti-Islam, if you like. There's a famous example I give in my book when the Taliban delegation comes to Peshawar and wants to have a negotiation with the chief secretary of the frontier province. In those days, it was the frontier province. And they walk in and they see a portrait of Mr. Jinnah behind the desk of the, uh, uh, the, the chair of the chief secretary. And they look at the portrait of Jinnah, turn around and walk out. And they say, unless that is removed, we won't talk to you. For them, Jinnah is the... And I remember quoting um, a paper that they used to bring out in London in the 1990s, mid-1990s, in which they said they had a whole article on Jinnah. And they said Jinnah is the ultimate, ultimate enemy of Islam. And the reason is because, they mention it you know, to answer your question, number one, he believes in giving women their rights. And number two, he believes in giving minorities like the Hindus and the Sikhs their rights. And that is, according to them, against Islam. So again, you are veering away from modernist Islam. So the 1970s, 80s, you are seeing what began to happen. You are seeing the shift in the Muslim world. And a lot of young people growing up at that time are fascinated, they are seduced. They feel maybe these, are, these uh, new leaders have the answers to the world. And modernist Islam is simultaneously failing. If modernist Islam had continued, if the courts were just, if the bureaucrats weren't corrupt, if they were efficient, then modernist Islam would have continued to hold its own. But it doesn't. So you see a simultaneous downfall of modernist Islam and you see the emergence of literalist Islam. Mystic Islam almost disappears. See, it's very interesting the correlation between these three. While this is happening in terms of real time, mystic Islam is almost fading away because it has no place in this world. To assert yourself, you are able to go in and blow yourself up in an office or in a school. Where does mystic Islam come into this? Mystic Islam speaks of love, of universal love, of tolerance. And that's the challenge. Why does Islam turn so violent? Why does Islam, or I should rather say Muslims rather than Islam, why do Muslims in certain parts of the world turn so violent? No, and, and, this and so much so that Islam has come to be equated with violence and horrendous images yeah. of behaving and things of this kind. I mean, only the forms of violence one can at least get a mental grip on, but this kind of violence one shudders. No, it's, it's absolutely shocking and believe me, it's more shocking to Muslims. Uh, I don't think any Muslim would condone the, the violence, particularly the kind of violence you're seeing today in uh, the Middle East and so on. Uh, women, children, uh, I gave you the example of the, um, the Pakistan Army Public School in Peshawar where 140 or 50 children were shot in class, yeah. Yeah. Muslims killing Muslims. So I don't think any, any Muslim would condone that. But because we have to be very careful here, uh, we cannot make statements like, why do Muslims have more violence? Because I can give exactly the same kind of violence among Christians, among other religions, among Hinduism. You know what's happening in India. You've got uh, mobs going around lynching people who they suspect may be eating beef and so on. Now that is not the norm that's happening because conditions have been created and those kinds of actions are taking place. So we have to be very sensitive. If you are equating the actions of 50, 100, 5,000 people to a population of a billion and a half people, then you're really not understanding that billion and a half people. This violence, I'm repeating this, is essentially those groups who are off the rails in terms of Islam and would be condemned by the mystics, by the modernists, and by the literalists. The scholars of Deoban, the scholars of Al-Azhar, the scholars of Islam would not condone this kind of violence. And you see this, every time there's some outrage, you will see the scholars condemning it. Now the paradox is, you know, you say that this is an image and you're right, it has become the image of Islam. The paradox is that you will not hear that condemnation in the media. So if you have a lot of ulema, religious scholars actually condemning the violence, you will not hear that in the media. You'll simply see the action and that's it. So people are not seeing how horrified Muslims are in terms of what took place. And we have to deal with this because um, the media very often is not sympathetic to Muslims. Uh, so very often the image of the Muslims is violent. Muslims are not usually able to explain themselves. There are not many Muslims in the media. I mean, I'm, I, I'm constantly amazed for a problem. That's why these figures are important in terms of the Nobel Prize, etc. Because they're not out there. So you don't hear very much. You don't see them on TV. You don't see them in the uh, newspapers. You don't see them in the columns. And the result is that other people are then able to speak for them. 
and other people then begin to explain Islam in these different terms, using terms like Islamists, Jihadists, etc. And therefore, further confuse ideas of Islam. That's why I say that there is a challenge, because I, that's why I say there is a crisis and Muslims have to correct it. Muslims have to correct it internally. And that's why it's critical for Muslims to understand that they have the resources internally to correct it. And when I go back to modernist Islam, I point to the tradition that began in the middle of the 19th century. It's a very solid foundation for Islam. Scholars, great minds, great thinkers, and you know, there's a whole list of people who come out of that tradition who can once again revive that tradition. That, I think, is a challenge for the young generation. In terms of uh, understanding Muslim anger, I wonder if one should t try to disaggregate the role of various factors the Western foreign policy, mm -hmm. taking different forms in different parts of the world. Second, internal feudal forces and reaction against that. Mm -hmm. uh, modernity, mm -hmm. ideas of gender equality and all that, and, and, and uh, feudal mm -hmm. elements within Islam or within Muslim societies resisting those things. I would like you to say something more about this. I mean, how do these various factors, in some cases violence occurs because uh, powers that be would not want to share their power with others or there are reactions to Western foreign policy or uh, th there is an international coalition between feudal forces within Muslim countries, powerful Western countries and those alliances fighting yes. against that. I wonder if one can understand Muslim anger and violence within that framework yes, and yes, make it more intelligible. It is, it is, and uh, you'll very often hear that. Muslims are vocal about this. They'll talk about these alliances that you're talking about. They'll point out that uh, a corrupt dictator, for example, may be supported by uh, Western powers. They do support them because it's easier to deal with one strong man. Uh, very often these strong men do not deliver the, the trains don't run on time, schools don't function, uh, the family the, of the dictator very often monopolizes wealth, and nothing is solved in society. So that anger, Bhikkhu, is genuine in the Muslim life. Muslims are very conscious that they did have a history, that something is going wrong, and they're not quite sure how to put it right. Mm. And that is causing the anger and the frustration. Um, and as I said uh, earlier, when I was traveling in Europe, and I came across these examples of what the Muslims had done. Literally, we were stunned. When you go to the Alhamra Palace in Granada, and I'm not sure how many people have been here, but I recommend you go and see it. It's the equivalent of the Taj Mahal here in the Western world. You're just stunned. You just look at it and you gape and you say, my God, we did this. And you look at what's happening today in terms of what we are doing today. So for me, that forces me to begin to ask the question, what happened? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if something happened which explains my downfall, then what would need to be done to get me back on my feet? This is the great challenge which I think Muslim scholars <coughs> must grapple with. Uh, and the first step is to understand that something positive was done by Muslims. It also ties up with politics here in, in Europe. Uh, as you know, a lot of the right-wing parties, right-wing movements in Europe are constantly blaming uh, Muslims for two things. They say the Muslim community is not European, they don't belong here, and number two, that Muslims have not contributed anything to Western culture. They haven't contributed a blank. They've lost, you know, they just parasites, they come here, they feed, feed off us, they take our social services, they haven't done anything. Now there again, because one ordinary trip in Europe will disprove both these points. Because <coughs> Muslims have been in Europe since the 8th century. Mm -hmm. 8th century means over a thousand years. Mm -hmm. So they've had a long, long period living here. Christians only came here a bit before that. The Jewish community came before that also from Asia. They didn't come from North America or the Arctic. Both these religions came from Asia. The Muslims followed. So they are very much um, European and they are indigenous Muslims in Europe like the Balkans, the Bosnians. They are from that area, from the soil. In terms of contribution, the contribution of Muslims to Europe are really very, very vast and complex. And that, I think, Muslim scholars, is a challenge for Muslims, need to work on that and bring that out. 
it's a challenge for centers like this to constantly bring that out. Uh, and I'm really, really uh, so grateful to uh, my friends and colleagues like uh, Amina and Peter and Zeba who have worked in this uh, project of theirs. You know, they've been working for, yeah. for years to bring out precisely this, that what Muslim culture, Muslim society has been doing. Because ordinary people in Europe who are, you know, as you said, the image is very negative. Islam is a violent religion. It has little to offer. That can only be corrected through scholarship and knowledge. Mm -hmm. If they're able to stand in the Granada Palace in Alhambra and look at it and say, my God, this is a country. It's the number one tourist site of Spain. This is what Muslims have done. When they're able to see the first man to fly as a Muslim, <coughs> what proof have you got? The main bridge of Cordoba is actually in the form of wings in honor of Ibn Farnas. There's a crater on the moon named after Ibn Farnas. So these are acknowledged, acknowledged uh, achievements. We need to get this to the public so people understand and with that there's more understanding of Muslims and therefore a less distorted picture of Muslims. And before I take the audience's questions, which I have, just one last question. Since IS is in the title, I'm sure people would want to ask me, want me to ask you about IS. Why this, I mean, what I find absolutely, completely disorienting is to understand why within uh, Islam you should have a movement looking for Khalifa wanting to set up in certain parts of the world and people from different parts of the world, young people being attracted to it. How do you understand this phenomenon? Both the sides of it. Yes. Why should a Khalifa, yes. <laughs> Khalif be set up? And having set up, whether it's an answer, this is another thing that puzzles me, that if one looks at these millenarian movements, mm. like the kinds of things that you had in Christianity, those millenarian movements had a left-wing orientation, sharing things, community and all that. Here it's, many of these movements are largely concerned with the exercise of power, patriarchy Authority. and all that. There is no uh, sharing the spirit. So I want to understand why these movements of this kind appear uh, and why does it seem to attract people in the West? ISIS is a phenomena that uh, obviously has captured the imagination of all of us because it's such a really frightening and ugly manifestation of society. Now, first of all, we have to understand, again, we have to be very, very careful because, again, a lot of people actually say, well, this is coming out of Islam. He's called a Khalifa. Now, first of all, the leadership, the aims, the behavior. I'm not sure which Muslims, certainly the Muslims I know, would even agree that any of that reflects Islam itself. Who are these leaders of ISIS? They're all coming out of the prison camps of Iraq, modern prison camps. They've been leaders in the prison gangs. They've been thugs, very effective thugs. They're all coming out of tribal politics and tribal society in Iraq and in Syria. So they're coming out of some system and that system is completely broken down. So we build this picture up. It's a tribal society which is in the state of throes of breakdown. They're implementing a very nasty form of tribal code of revenge, they, which they're implementing. You know all these brutal punishments and things coming straight out of uh, the tribal code. And they have power. Why do they have power? Because the state of Iraq is just in a, st in a condition of collapse. Yes, disintegrating. So they take one village, then another town, another city. Suddenly they have oil fields, suddenly they have money. And the West says, what, who the hell are these guys? In fact, they're coming out of the very invasion of Western troops into, into Iraq. It's a product of that. So please understand that similarly, Shabab in uh, Somalia, Boko Haram in West Africa, the TTP in Pakistan, they're all coming out of specifically tribal societies. Tribal societies which themselves are breaking down. Tribal leadership, religious leadership, and central government authority in those societies. Now, are they Islamic? They claim to be Islamic. Again, with all religions, you can interpret the religion any way you want. Where do we place them in our categories? They're not modernists. They're not mystic, certainly. Their targets are very often mystic. They would like to ally themselves with a kind of literalist form of Islam, and they're not. If you talk to Islamic scholars, which I have, they'd be horrified at this, this kind of Islam. Islam above all, because as you know, you're a scholar in the, in the social sciences, Islamic scholars will assert the fact that Islam stands for 
justice, for balance, for knowledge, for tradition. It doesn't stand for someone who says, I am the Khalif and I am going to now command this and these women are my wives and they are it's your wives and so on. So. This is chaos. It, it is really like coming out of some comic book. And because we are in the 21st century, we accept them. We sort of say, this is like Marvel comics now. He's the Khalif. <coughs> Who's the Khalif? I mean, it's like a joke. Why can't I be the Khalif? Or why can't one of my Muslim friends, why can't uh, just Justice Drabu be the Khalif? He probably knows much more and he's a justice also. So you have… Why do some people accept that as Khalif? <laughs> of course they do. Eh? Of course they do because, because human nature being what it is, we're working within what sort of societies are these? These are largely illiterate societies. So you even put a dance, you put a hat on a dance and you say he's the king of Japan or he's the king, people say yes, hey, all hail to you. I mean, this Shakespeare, don't you read your Shakespeare where suddenly everyone starts hailing them. The whole Julius Caesar thing leading to his thing, people begin to accept that he's going to be emperor, he's going to be one king, then the Democrats hit back. So societies have the tendency to begin to fall behind a strong man and that's what you're seeing. These are societies that are disintegrating and for the Sunnis, they're providing a kind of leadership. So we are legitimizing our tribal leadership plus our religious leadership. I am the Khalif. And I go back to Abu Bakr, the first Khalif. And a lot of illiterate villagers are going to say, yes, he is. With Mr. Jinnah, now you were talking of Mr. Jinnah, who as you know is very, very, he wasn't orthodox. He didn't say his prayers five times a day. He was a Muslim, but not an orthodox Muslim. And yet with Jinnah, Bhikkhu people started saying, and they say today, they say, Rahmatullah Ali, they respect him so much. They, they have elevated him almost into a saint. That's how people begin to project their religious ideas of a leader onto that leader and their own imagination. So a man like that or any other leader, they begin to build him up in their uh, societies, particularly in societies that are undergoing a crisis. And these societies are going through all of these. Somalia, I mentioned, um, Iraq, Syria, the Taliban, that whole Afghanistan built. These are societies in flux. You wouldn't trust them with democracy? I would trust democracy with them, which means sooner or later <laughs> democracy will prevail. <laughs> well, I think uh, on that point I have been asked to uh, read out to you some of the questions that the audience has asked. Uh, and uh, by and large I think the audience is very interested in uh, two or three questions. One is the Saudis funding Madrasas. Mm -hmm. And isn't it the case that mu much of the uh, conservative element comes from madrasas? Would you agree with that? Yes, the uh, a lot and of the especially ma madrasas peddling this Wahhabi Islam. Yes, a lot of the madrasas, uh, especially in the uh, tribal areas of Pakistan, when I was uh, serving there, a lot of them were funded by uh, sources outside Pakistan, and a lot of the these schools. We must remember the nature of these schools. Uh, madrasa simply means a school where children who normally would not go to school because there are no other schools available would sit under a tree and it'd be educated. So along comes a Saudi or an Iranian or some better off Muslim country representative and says, I'll give you a school, I'll give you two rooms, four rooms. But with that very often they say, here's a syllabus also, here's a book. Now that is where I think the government of Pakistan can be much more vigilant, much more active and begin to really reform, update and change the syllabi in these schools because you need those schools. Mm -hmm. If you stop the madrasas per se, as mad madrasa just means a school, mm -hmm. simple as that. Mm -hmm. If you close the madrasas, you will close, I don't know how many there are, maybe a, a million, a million and a half kids in school. You will have them out in the streets and they are fodder for any kind of religious war that was available. They'll cross the borders or they'll go into the rest of Pakistan and then there'll be trouble. You need them to be in school and you need to improve the level of education. Bring in computers, bring in teachers, bring in uh, cross uh, school uh, visitations, uh, conferences, debates. Get them involved in the world that we live in. Make them aware of their inheritance as Pakistanis or as Muslims, of their culture, their history. I don't think they have access to a lot of this. Mm -hmm. That's what I would want. Well, there's a young student called Sammy Lamy who I think asked an intelligent, uh, interesting who question. Samuel Lamy Samuel. asked an interesting question. 
the kind of discourse which looks at everything from an Islamic point of view in Pakistan and uh, why is it that the whole society has got used to thinking in religious terms and expecting religious answers? Again, Biko, I think whoever asked the question, is he a Pakistani? Where is, is what's his name? Samuel? Lemmy. Samuel, Samuel here? Samuel who asked this question? Hmm? Well, he asked the question and disappeared. <laughs> Thinking I'll do his job for him. <laughs> well, uh, th the answer to that is that it's simply not, not correct. Uh, I was in a Pakistani school, Burn Hall. My class fellow is sitting here, Hassan Akhtar. Uh, we were together 60 years ago in school, up in Pakistan, Ab Abtabad, North Pakistan. Excellent school. Uh, still run by the government of Pakistan, so it's still functioning to the best of my knowledge. Produced a lot of very distinguished people. We had one of my class fellows was Wasim Sajjad, who became uh, acting president of Pakistan, chairman of the Senate. Uh, Mahmoud Ali Durrani, who was general in the Pakistan army and so on. So I don't think this is correct that uh, only Islam. I wish that we had been taught a bit more of Islamic history and culture and so on. I feel that was something that was missing. Don't you agree, Hassan? I know. Ali, I hope you're noting all this and you're going to make up for this, yes? <laughs> there is also a question about the why has the British government not succeeded in connecting with the Islamic youth? Because this is a challenge, I think, not only for the British government, it's a challenge for the German government, the French government, wherever Muslims are living, because this is also a challenge for Muslim elders themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, we found on this journey, and frankly I'm sure you'll agree with this, that a lot of the young generation here in the West is disconnected from the older generation. Mm -hmm. That communication is breaking down. Not completely, but it is breaking down. So you'll see a lot of the youngsters now working in the basement on a computer. And that's the danger, but they're in touch with, horizontally with the whole world. The parents are thinking something else, they're thinking that they are still in a kind of bubble of their own culture. And the result is that very often they begin to lose the young generation. And the values that should have come out, they should have lived in and then begun, begun to share the larger values of society, that hasn't quite happened in some cases. We studied some of these uh, youngsters who go off to the Middle East and you have something like 5,000 people who've gone off from uh, Europe. And that is just too many in number, you see. I mean, the fact that they're going to join a bang, band as crazy as ISIS means some, there's a double failure. There's a failure of what those guys are doing and a failure here of Muslim families who have created conditions where their own young generation is wandering off. Something has gone wrong somewhere and someone needs to do a lot of serious thinking is about it. crisis within the Muslim community? Yes, the Muslim community because if the Muslim community is not in contact with its own younger generation, there is, a, there is a breakdown of communication, not in all families, thankfully, but in society as a whole, which in fact means that the third generation, and you'll see some of this in our film, uh, film tomorrow, uh, we talk to a lot of youngsters, we talk to um, elders in the community, they all complain that the communication system is broken down. Mm -hmm. And that means that very often the values that the third generation needs to carry on in terms of their own culture are not there, they simply don't exist. They're, they're very confused. They, are they Pakistanis? Are they British? Are they Scots? Are they Irish? Uh, are they Muslim? If they're Muslim, what kind of Muslim? Are they Deobandi? Are they Barelvi? These are questions, Bhikkhu, that they would like to talk to. If you're a Jewish boy, you go and talk to your rabbi. If you're a Christian, you go to your priest. A lot of these youngsters have only the local imam or the local mullah. And unfortunately, we found this throughout Europe, a lot of these mullahs and imams, very often, well-meaning, but very often they are complete strangers to this culture. Mm -hmm. So that in Germany, most of the imams are from Turkey and they don't speak German. Now, if you're 18 years old and you come to your imam and you say, look, uh, these are my problems. Like an 18-year-old, their problems are going to be drugs, sex, gender, dancing, you know, all the problems that kids have. They can't talk to their parents. So they're going to go and talk to the mullah or the imam the imam will say, what are you talking about? Aren't you ashamed of even raising these issues? <laughs> so they're not going to talk to them. What happens then? You know, they're blocked. Sure, sure. And here, of course, I think it's changing, but in my time, 
most of the imams were from uh, Pakistan. Mm. So again, there was a communication, a cultural communication gap. In France, the same thing, a lot of the imams are from Algeria. Again, they're not attuned to French Local culture. culture. Ah, so this, this is a challenge, this is a challenge. Mm. And again, the point about government, I think the British government can do a lot in helping a better communication between religious and Muslim political leadership and administration. Much, much better communication. And I think efforts are being made. I know that uh, the Muslims now in uh, high places in, in uh, the administration here. I know I was part of uh, Commander Chishti's attempts to get uh, Muslim leaders and the administration together. Uh, last time I was here, I attended uh, one or two of his sessions. So there are attempts being made, but they need to be made much more vigorously and much, much more frequently. Well, on that point, I think we have I'm going to take some questions. My question is yes, from the audience. Professor Aman Rahman Mane. That uh, is a learned uh, professor. After all, what is the religion of the military industrial complex? Because I suspect that the religion of Daesh and military industrial complex is the same. I would like to be educated that what is the religion of military industrial complex? which were, were, were responsible for World War I, World War II, and the war continues. I would like to be educated. In the uh, light of your immense knowledge. Thank you, Abhanullah Khan, for asking that very uh, penetrating question. Now, when you say military industrial complex, are you referring to the, the military industrial complex that President Eisenhower referred to? Eisenhower had, in the, also in the 50s and 60s. So you're talking about the United States or the UK or Pakistan or Middle East, which, which military industry? Sir, is, you are a professor in Western uh, the capitals of knowledge and which had been in the Islamic world too. But uh, I think uh, that uh, the military industrial complex is a continuum and it, it has never expired, it has never died, it continues and now maybe it travels from Earth to the Mars. Maybe I'm rather overstretching, but what I want to know, what is the religion of military industrial complex and the religion of Daesh? Because Daesh, the monster, has come from the same bottle, you know. I want to know the religion of military industrial complex. Well, Amanullah Khan is a good question. Let me think about it. Next time Dr. Amina invites me to Suez, I'll give you the answer for that. <laughs> right. Any other? Uh, shall we take a few questions? Yeah, well, yes, I'm going to take about three or four questions. Shorter the questions and shorter the answers, Yes. the better it would be to finish it by 8 o'clock, which o we must, yes. come what may. Okay, so, so, who would like to ask questions, please? Raise, raise your hands. Yes, please. Yeah, I just like to ask, this is always a big man where the people going after, but I don't know any name of ISIS. And there are I don't know, is it, just the is it just the propaganda or they don't have names? The leadership, it's a state, but there is no names about who is leading this state. Why is it? Okay, let's take, let's take a few questions, then I'm going to answer them yes. together. Yes, please, gentlemen here. And there you are, yeah. Next to you. Okay. Um, professor, you talked about the three uh, trends of Islam, sophistic, modernist and, um, and the literate. But what happened after physical independence of Muslim countries, those who were the leaders, they were, the, many of them didn't have any, any link or touch with Muslim Islam. They were secularists. The highly secularist means uh, to, the, to, the, to the extent of anti-Islam. And criminally incompetent and corrupt people so there was no modernist Islam phase, in my opinion. What, what do you say? There was a hand, yes, please, at the back of the, yes, please, right at the back. The lady over there. Thank you. My question is, um, you have already said that violent movements such as ISIS do not embrace literalist Islam. Um, and it has often been argued that these movements are rather political movements than religious movements. Do you think that the element of religion can be fully extracted from such violent movements? Last question. Yes, please. There are three hands going up. Could I select one of them, please? 
just here, right in the center. Yes, here, yeah. Um, we were talking about the wholesale refusal of Muslims of violence. Um, and interesting, you cite the example of Al-Azhar in Egypt, which from personal experience, I feel very much encapsulates a lot of the problems facing the religion today. Um, Al-Azhar is currently facing a massive identity crisis in that a lot of the younger clerics um, are very much preaching a Wahhabist ideology, and this is gaining traction among young, educated, and well-read Muslims. Um, so treating Al-Azhar as the gold standard of liberal Islam is very problematic, and we're not looking at some of the theological precedents that um, embody, let's say, ISIS, or much less extreme examples as well. I've got five, about four minutes to four answer minutes, those Four questions. minutes, four questions. First question, leader of ISIS, you feel that there is no recognizable leader. On the contrary, Baghdadi is not only very recognizable, but he's very possessive about people challenging his leadership. So I'd be careful if I was you. <laughs> he is very, he says, I'm the khalif, and there can only be one khalif. Uh, Dr. Bari, you talked about modernist Islam being corrupt and not practicing and being secular, but that's exactly what I'm saying. That's what I've been saying. Modernist Islam has not lived up to its ideal. The third question was about uh, religion and extracting religion from ISIS. Well, that is the challenge of ISIS. I believe sooner or later all these movements, unless they legitimately move towards mainstream central Islam, the notions of central Islam, they will fall by the wayside and remain very marginal. Fourth question about Al-Azhar. I think you misunderstood. I didn't say that that was the gold standard for liberal Islam. On the contrary, I said that was literalist Islam. Modernist Islam is Aligarh. So you're confusing Aligarh with Al-Azhar, two very different universities on two different continents. Um, there's, there's one last question. Shall we, right, shall we end with a woman asking yes, questions? Of course, yes, we'll have the last question, please. Especially recommended. Um, so basically, in the title of uh, the subject, it's written Paris. So we talked a lot of uh, Pakistan, a little bit of ISIS, let's say, but we didn't talk about uh, Paris. And uh, basically, I, I want to say that because I guess um, the, the Muslims, they don't have the same history. And when you say that the youth uh, have a problem of communication with their parents, I think probably also because their parents don't have that knowledge in Islam, so they have, they have not been able to transmit that to their children. Like, let's say, for example, uh, Algerian people, it's uh, one of the history which is different from other countries. Um, and also, on the top of this um, lack of communication, maybe there, there is also um, identity crisis, which is not resolved by the society, especially the Western societies. So I would like you to comment on that. Yeah. Uh, my friend Lord Bhikkhu Parak has a train to catch, so I'll try to keep it very brief. The reason we didn't comment on Paris was, uh, I was being guided by my friend here, but Paris is again a symbol of something. And we have studied Muslims in France, Belgium, the continent, and there's a very different dynamic at play there. For example, Abdus Salam, I'll be very brief on this, but it's fascinating. Abdus Salam had a joint in one hand and a beer in the other hand when he watched ISIS videos. Now to me, that's not a classic Muslim going to do jihad on the for the cause of Islam. Something else is driving him. Something else that was driving him is the relationship of that community with the state and the society within which he's living. And we can go into that. Another factor is that Abdul Salam and the groups involved in Paris came from the Rif region of Morocco. So here we have tribal Islam and yet another factor involved in this relationship. That's very far from South Asian Islam. South Asian Islam would not even know what a riff is. But those are the riffs who are involved in the Madrid bombing, in Paris, and in Belgium. And we'll talk about it at the reception. Well, thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm sure you would like me to thank uh, Professor Ahmed for a fascinating discussion. And I... <laughs> and I must... 
And I'm sure you would also like me to thank Amina for organizing this lecture. And may you. And uh, a big thank you to Piku for being available at a time of a family emergency. Thank you. Thank you.